the church is not a select circle of the Immaculate, but a home where the outcast may come in. It is not a palace with gate attendants and challenging sentinels along the entranceways, holding off at arm's length the stranger, but rather a hospital where the brokenhearted may be healed, and where all the weary and troubled may find rest and take counsel together. Well, good morning and welcome to Southcrest. How's everybody doing this morning? Wow, that's actually pretty good. Y'all woke up early this morning or something. That's fantastic. Well, uh, that means I have to do a good job then, I guess, huh? Oh, well. All right, so um, we have, we're glad you're here with us today, though. We are so excited that you're here with us, those that join us online. So glad you guys are part of us. Uh, today, we're starting a brand new sermon series, and we're going to be talking about the church. Like, what exactly is the church? Because I think in today's day and age, there's this large disconnect from when we talk about church and what our minds go to, to what God intended the church to be. I think there's this large gap that's formed in that area. And um, in America, the opinion of the church has been on a steady decline and continues to fall. As a matter of fact, um, people look at the church now and if you were to ask people about the church, a lot of times you get things like they're, they're hypocritical or they're too political, uh, the church can be tone deaf, or, or the church just isn't relevant to what we're going through today. You see, the church has a reputation problem, and that reputation problem is affecting evangelism on the outside of how we reach other people who aren't part of the church, but it's also having impact on retaining those who are on the inside. In other words, our back door has just as much movement sometimes as our front door, if not more movement. And so the question is, what do we do about that, right? How do, how do we move forward in, in that arena? According to recent surveys from the Gallup and Pew uh, polls that have been done, we have found that more Americans than ever have a negative opinion of the church. Only 36% of Americans today believe that the church has a great impact on our society and are very confident in what the church is doing, 36%. Now, there's another about 30% that believes the church is doing an okay job. But for the most part, about three in 10 Americans believe the church actually has a negative impact on society, that the church is actually not good for America. Basically, a third of Americans believe that to be true. Also, according to those studies, there's a significant impact on the church when it comes to partisan beliefs. Now, here's the thing about it. It doesn't say that one party or the other may not enjoy church, but it becomes an issue in that church. Uh, there was a study done, and when they're looking at this, they found that when you look at teenagers who regularly attended church, not teenagers who pop in here or there, but teenagers who regularly attend church that you can constantly see, like these guys right here up front, that we see them every single Sunday up here, these teenagers that are regular, 66% of them stop attending church between the ages of 18 and 22. And there's a primary factor in that. And that primary factor is political disagreement. Uh, the executive director of Life Road Research, guy by Scott McDonald, he put it this way. The primary choice churches offer people is not political, but the opportunity to follow Christ. Neither conservative nor liberal politics keep young adults from church. But when a church communicates political views that differ from a young adult, that person is much less likely to walk that church's aisle. In other words, they'll stay at your church as long as they agree 100% with what you say. But the minute you challenge or say something different, that's it. It's over. I, I don't want to deal with that anymore. I'll go somewhere else or nowhere. You see, when I look at the view of the church that America has today, it saddens me and it also angers me. Because here's the thing about it. If people are upset with the church in America today, that means it stems from a bigger problem. That problem is they have no clue what the Bible has to say. They have no clue what the Bible teaches. And what they do know of the Bible, most of them, is what they've heard someone else talk about the Bible. And as you know, in today's day and age, the more we hear, that's 100% true, right? 
I mean, if we get on the Googles or we do something else, we know that's got to be true because that's what the Bible says. But here's the thing about it, guys. Very few people are reading the Bible for themselves, looking at the Bible and saying, what does the word of God say and how does that affect my life? And so we're making decisions. We're making decisions based on what we hear. Guys, I've told you this before. If you take everything I say for gospel truth, you're not doing church right. You should be taking what I say, going back and looking at what the Bible says and saying, Pete was an idiot. That was wrong. And you can call me and say, Pete, you messed that up. And I'm okay with that. Because here's the thing. That means that you're reading the word of God yourself and you're determining what it says. And that's what we're supposed to do. So let me share with you some truth today, okay? C.S. Lewis said this, the church exists for nothing else but to draw men into Christ, to make them little Christ. If they are not doing that, all the cathedrals, clergy, missions, sermons, even the Bible itself are simply a waste of time. So how have we gotten so far away from the church and what it was intended to be, right? How have we missed that mark? And in this sermon series, we're going to be talking through that. We're going to be looking at what the church is supposed to be and trying to get back on track to where we should be heading, okay? So G.K. Chesterton, uh, he put it this way. We do not want a church that will move with the world. We want a church that will move the world. And that's my prayer. At the end of this sermon series, that we will know that, hey, we're not here just to be a part of this world. We're here to change it to make an impact on it. So, you know, back when I was in college, uh, my senior year, I was our entertainment board chairman. Um, and so uh, that was just a cool thing to say that I was the most fun guy on campus, right? Um, there's too much laughter. Okay, so uh, yeah, so I was the cool guy who, who got to throw big fun events for the college. And our biggest event was Spring Fling. And Spring Fling was a weekend full of events. And, and the culmination of that was the Saturday night we had these huge concerts. And so what we would do is we would book whatever popular bands, uh, local bands were out at that time, and we would book them to the college, and then we would have a concert. But we, we did it right, okay? It, it wasn't like we set up like, you know, pieces of plywood with two by fours underneath them for the stage. Uh, We would rent a full outdoor stage. So this is the type of thing you would see if you went to an outdoor concert. There's a big 40 foot by 60 foot with a scaffolding on the sides with a big, we would rent that. And um, and then that was cool. Uh, Except for my Saturday of spring fling was one of the longest days in my life because I would get up about eight o'clock to meet the stage truck. And I had a group of students with me. We would get out there, meet the stage truck. This big, basically, 18-wheeler would pull up. We would unload that, and we would begin to build the stage. So there were these platforms that we would lay out, and then we would start putting on these jacks underneath the platform legs. Um, and as, once we got going on that, the guy who owned the stage would go and start leveling the screw jacks so the stage would be level all the way across the ground. Uh, and once we got done with that, we would start to build scaffolding in all four corners. And you'd raise that scaffolding up, and it was about uh, 30 foot high on the scaffolding there. And then you would carry up these large winches and put them on top of the scaffolding. And those winches were used to hoist up the canopy that went over the stage. Then we would come back down after doing that, and we would actually build the canopy. So it was like this aluminum truss system that we'd bolt together. And then once we had that built on the stage floor, you would put this big like canvas tarp all over it, tie that down, and then we would raise it up about six feet in there. Now, we had to have all this done by noon, because at noon that day, the lighting guy was coming. And the light guy would come, and we'd raise that canopy about six feet in the air. He would come, and he'd start hanging lights. And as he was hanging lights, and once he got it done, then we could hoist the canopy all the way back up uh, to, his, to the height it needed to be. And to do that, you had to get four guys up on the scaffolding. You all had to crank the hand cranks all the way up. We didn't have electric things back then. It wasn't cool. We did it all by hand. And uh, about four o'clock that day, it's about two o'clock today, the, the sound guy would get there, and he'd start setting up all the speakers and all that type stuff. Because at four o'clock, the band starts showing up for sound checks. And then at seven o'clock, we'd have the concert. And then when the concert was done, guess what happens? It all has to come back down. Now, one of my favorite moments in college happened. Um, we, were, we were taking the scaffolding down. It was right in front of, we had this like circular drive with like four dorms on it. And there were uh, one guy's dorm and then three girls' dorms. And so the stage was in front of this girl's dorm because it was the bottom of the circle. And it's about one in the morning and, and we're like climbing the scaffolding, trying to take it apart real quiet and pass it down. And I'm up there, you're like, you know, 25, 30 feet in the air, and this girl on the third floor opens their windows like, could y'all please keep it down? And I'm sitting there thinking, what? So the guy who owns the stage stuff was like, what'd she say? And I was like, she wants us to be more quiet. And he was like, hey, all that stuff, 
it don't break. And I was like, wait a minute. He goes, throw me that piece of scaffolding. So we just started throwing this stuff. It was very noisy. And uh, we had a lot of time. We got done faster, and we made all the noise. And then when he left, he cranked up the air horn in his truck and laid on the air horn all the way out of the parking lot. It, it, was, it was fantastic. So um, <laughs> that was about 2 in the morning when we got done. Hey, we had to do what we had to do, you know? But um, that concert was always a huge success. And as I got looking back on that, it reminded me, though, that every part of what we did that day was important for making that concert happen, right? If you've ever been to a concert, and um, why do you go to the concert, right? To see what? The band, right? You don't go to see the stage, okay? I don't, nobody's like, man, I heard they got this cool stage. I'm going to go see it. No, you go to see the bands, right? And they're the ones that get all the praise. They're the ones everybody comes to watch. Because um, we'd have local people from the community come to watch the bands because they were popular bands. And so that's how everybody comes to see, and the, the, the band gets all the credit. Every once in a while, somebody will go up to a sound guy who knows what they're doing. like, hey, man, that, that sounded really good tonight. I appreciate that. And on occasion, you might be like, those lights were kind of cool. But I've never seen anybody walk up to the guy standing by the stage like, hey, dude, of all the stages I've ever seen, this is the coolest stage, okay? It just doesn't happen. But let me tell you something. If all of those things don't fall into place, that concert is a hot mess. If the lights don't work and that concert's at night, you can hear the music, but you can't see anything, right? If the sound guy doesn't know what he's doing, no matter how good the band's playing, it can sound like garbage. And if the stage doesn't hold together, well, that makes a very interesting show, okay? Because it all comes tumbling down. So everything's important, everything has a part, everything has a place, even though all of them don't get the same amount of credit, even though all of them are given the same shine, okay? And so we, we got to say, and say, hey, what are we going to do to understand this as it comes to, to our lives, right? Because have any of you ever been a, part, been a part of something bigger than yourself? And I would say for all of you, the answer would be yes, right? So unless you were homeschooled and were only child, and then uh, you are self-employed and only have one employee yourself, then your life has been part of a group effort. Most of you, week in and week out, what you do for a living is part of a team effort. It's part of a group effort. It's not just about you and what you can do. It's about what other people you work with contribute as well to bring success about. And so I think all of us have this understanding of what it means to work as a, a group, as a team, right? I mean, we see this when it comes to sports all the time. Uh, there's different people on uh, different sports teams that carry different roles that make the team successful. For instance, when you play soccer, everybody uses their feet except for one guy. The goalie, he gets to use his hands. He has a special, special role. And, and then when you get to baseball, there's like this guy who's a pitcher, and he throws the ball, and there's a guy who's a catcher who catches it. And if, if one of them is not there, it looks really silly. Like, can you imagine going to a game with no pitcher? You got the catcher standing back there, everybody's ready to go, and you just, like, they just stay that way because there's not a pitcher? There's an importance, right? Or in football, right? Everybody says, who's the most important player on the field, right? Quarterback. I mean, we hear that nowadays all the time. It, it's not that this team is playing this team. It's this guy, oh, and the team he's with, is playing this other guy and the team he's with. Right? It's the quarterback. We command that. But hey, uh, if the quarterback's by himself and there's no other players, he's going to get killed. Right? He's going to get crushed. And so he relies on all these other skilled position players to make him what? Look good. To make him do his job well. And so we realize when it comes to a lot of things in our life, we understand that different people have different roles. It's just not all of them get the same amount of, uh, of credit as everybody else does. And we're going to see today that the church is no different. And we're going to be looking at the church today as one of the attributes we see in Scripture, and that is the church is the body of Christ. Okay, that we are his body, built for a purpose. Now, we are called the body of Christ because the Bible says that Jesus is the head of the church. So we can't be the head, so we're all that's left over. We're, we're the body, and we make up and we get things done. We have different skills, talents, purposes, spiritual gifts, but every single one of us is equally important when it comes to reaching the world for Christ, if, to, to doing what the body is supposed to do. And, and I think that body of Christ is a very significant term and a good way for us to understand it. Because first of all, it reminds us each and every day that it's not about us that it's about Jesus, that we're doing this for someone else. It's not for our glory, it's for his glory. But it also reminds us 
that we have a purpose and that we should all be moving together to get that purpose accomplished, even though we may not all be doing the same thing. Because it highlights the diversity within the church and the different skills everybody has. 1 Corinthians 12 says this way, Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, that we might understand the things freely given us by God. And we impart this in word, not taught by human wisdom, but taught by the spirit, interpreting spiritual truths to those who are spiritual. These natural persons does not accept the things of the spirit of God, for they are folly to him. And he's not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. And that was the wrong verses. That was fantastic. I messed that up. So let me read you what I'm supposed to have. For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body through many are one body, so it is with Christ. For in one spirit we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free. And all were made to drink of one spirit. For the body does not consist of one member, but of many. Okay? You know the thing about technology? It is only as good as the moron behind the keyboard. So uh, that was me this morning. So... Um, there may be more like that. I don't know. It's going to be kind of a, sh you know, y'all have to read these up and look and be like, yell at me like, nope, nope, stop. Okay, cool. Cool. All right. Fantastic. So in the New Testament, Paul refers to the church as the body of Christ. He used that metaphor to relay significant truths about the church so we would better understand the value of diversity within the church. There was a big issue back in that day with who you were when it came to being in the church. Not just who you were, but you, you read later in scripture, it, it talks about some were led to the church by Apollos and some by Peter and some by Paul. And they would actually form cliques and say, we were better than you because Paul was our leader and you only had Peter as your leader. And they would get fights over it. And he's like, no, 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 none of that stuff matters. You're, you're getting off track. It doesn't matter how you got here. What matters is what you do when you get here. Okay, so that's what's happening here. So, your body, just like the body of the church, has many different parts, all of them valuable, and all of them play different roles. They have different skills. And we're working together to accomplish this mission rather than doing the same thing. Because if you had 11 quarterbacks on the field, it'd be a very boring game. And you would watch all these small guys getting crushed by all these defensive players. So it may be enjoyable for a little bit. It's like watching NASCAR for the Rex, right? But after a while, you'd be like, okay, I'm, I'm tired of this. I want to see something else happening. So as we continue in 1 Corinthians, we see this. If the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing? If the whole body were an ear, where would be the sense of smell? But as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each one of them, as he chose. If all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, yet one body. So each one of us is valuable to the church. Each one of us has a place and is needed when it comes to the body of Christ. And we should recognize that and celebrate that instead of trying to look at it from a negative standpoint. And, and when we look at the New Testament, we'll see this term body used in many other locations. And from those different locations, we learn more what it means to be about who God's called us to be as this body of Christ and what that is supposed to look like for us. We all have different roles, but they're necessary. For instance, if you go to Romans uh, chapter 12, it says, for as in one body, we have many members and the members do not have all the same function. So we, though many are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. Having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us hear them if prophecy in proportion to our faith in service and our servicing, the one who teaches and is teaching, the one who exhorts in his exhortation, the one who contributes in generosity, the one who leads with zeal, the one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. See, though we're individuals, there's to be unity within the body. And we're all to do what we're supposed to do to the best of our abilities, and that moves the body forward in Christ in, in, in unity. And we're called to be united in faith and what joins us together is that faith in Jesus Christ, not in the fact that we happen to be here today. Again, we see Ephesians 4, 11 through 12 says, and he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and teachers. And it says, to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ. So when the church works together, when the church is joined and working together, we can function appropriately in the role that God has given to us. 
But when there's disharmony in the church, it's difficult to fulfill the mission. Any of you ever broken a bone before? Any, like broken an arm, broken a leg? Yeah, uh, it, it's not fun. And, and some of us break an arm and then break another arm right away. You're not gonna name any names, but you know, we, we have some of those people. And, and that, that happens, but here's the thing about it. There's parts of our body that we don't think much about until you break them. Like I'm, I'm right-handed, okay? And so I don't put much thought into my left hand, but I've broken bones in my, my left arm and all of a sudden my world stops. Like I didn't realize how much I used it until I've lost it. And, and when there's disharmony, when there's things that happen in the church that cause injury or need repair, it, it can affect the whole body. And so we have to work together to come back and say, how, how do we move forward past this? How do we move forward through this, right? Going on in Ephesians there, it says this. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head into Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and held together by every joint with which is it equipped. When each part is working properly, it makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. I don't want to miss that part in love, that we're joining together through Christ in love to fulfill that purpose. And it's Jesus who knits us all together. It's that common thread in all of us, that relationship with Christ that helps us walk together in faith. And it reminds us again that we're knit together in Christ, that he's still the head. He pushes down through us so we can complete what he wants us to do. And finally, in Colossians 1.18, we see this. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. So as members of this body of Christ, we've all been given spiritual gifts. And using these spiritual gifts is a key part of how we get to be a faithful member of the church. We all have different skills, different personalities. Some of us are introverted. Some of us are extroverted. Some of us like to do things everybody can see. Some of us like to stay in the shadows. But God can use every single one of those things because God has given us those gifts. God has given us those personalities and all those traits. We should never compare our gifts with somebody else's gifts. We should never be like, well, they're better at this than I am. So God created them for that, not you for that. You should focus on what God has done in you, not looking at others. You see, the one thing that matters is that all of us have accepted Christ as our Lord and Savior, that we all understand who he is. And then through him, it enables us to do all that we're supposed to be done. You see, it's an honor to have God in our lives, to, to, to work salvation in us something we can't earn for ourselves, something that he freely gave us and that we just have to accept. And as we understand all that's happening here, then that should enable us to be the body, to move out and get things accomplished, to use those gifts, to use what God has given us to make an impact to the world around us. God wants us to be close. He wants us to be unified in purpose, unified in the vision that he has set forth through each others. And when the church body becomes close, It magnifies each other's gifts. It gives us an opportunity to see other sides of each other that we can't always see at a distance. You see, when that moment arises and we can clearly see that God-given talents and strengths in one another, we should celebrate and encourage one another, not judge one another. We should lift each other up and support one another. Look at those talents and say, I'm so glad you can do that because it creates a stronger, more unified body. First Peter 4, 10 through 11 puts it this way. It says that as each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. Whoever speaks is one with speaks oracles of God. Whoever serves is one who serves by the strength that God supplies. In order that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to him belong glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. See, we also need to recognize the importance of this unity. True unity is the only way the church can function to fulfill God's potential. And there's a whole lot in the world that wants to disunify us. There's a whole lot that wants to cause problems. And it's our job to follow after God. That's why I said earlier, it's so important that we read the Bible for ourselves. That we understand what unity is rooted in, where where it's grounded from, where that is. Because there's a lot of different opinions, but there's only one truth and that's God's truth. So, So how does all that apply to us today, right? Knowing that we're the body of Christ, great. Now what are we supposed to do with that? right? Because that's the biggest question. Faith without actions is useless. 
And that has become one of the biggest issues in the church. We have, we have a lot of people in our, in our churches who, who just don't get involved, get connected. That, that faith, it, it turned to action. It just doesn't become action. Have you ever noticed when something bad happens in society, where's the first place that everybody looks? You ever notice that? Who's supposed to fix it? The church, right? That's the question we always get. When when something bad happens in society, what's the church going to do about this? How's the church going to handle this? Now, I actually find that quite comical. Because here we have a group of people in this world. I mean, just look at the stuff we talked about earlier. Most of America has no value for the church, no care for the church. Basically looks at God and says, I really don't care about you. I don't like you, God. I could care less. But when something bad happens, what's the first thing we do? God, where were you? God, why'd you let that happen? Well, if you don't like God, then don't blame God. We, we have this huge disconnect of what's happening. And so when something bad happens in our society, the first thing they do is say, what's the church going to do about it? Now, there's an inherent problem in that question. Because there's a misunderstanding, once again, of what the church is when that question is asked. And before I get too off the topic, I'm going to read what C.S. Lewis had to say about this because he said it so well, and I don't. So this is what it says. People say the church ought to give us a lead. That is true if they mean that some Christians, those who happen to have the right talents, should be economists and statesmen, and that their whole efforts in politics or economics should be directed to putting do as you would be done to into action. If that happened, and if, and if we others were really ready to take it, then we should find the Christian solution for our own social problems pretty quickly. But of course, when they ask for a lead from the church, what most people mean they want is that the clergy to put on a political program, and that is silly. The clergy are those particular people within the whole church who have been specially trained. We're asking them to do a quite different job for which they have not been trained. The job is really on us, on the layman. You see, the church is not a one-man show. I am not the church. Myself, John, and Joshua are not the church. We are the staff. We are the people who work here for a living. Okay, this is our jobs. It's also a calling place in our lives, but this is why we're here. Okay, we are part of the church, but we are not the church. Look at Jesus. You remember that guy, Jesus? Yeah, yeah. He's kind of the start of this whole thing. What did he do? When he wanted to continue on past him, what did he do? He got one other person and trained him, right? He was like, what's one other person can be the church, right? No, what did he do? How many did he pick? 12. I'm gonna take 12 guys and train them everything I need to know. And then what did he tell those 12 to do? Go and train other people. Because it's not a one-man show. It's about all these people. It's about this thing that's gonna be called a body, And this body is going to come together and it's going to accomplish more as a group than any one person could ever accomplish on their own. And so what's happening here is that Jesus is trying to show us that we are the ones to make things happen collectively as a church, as a group of believers. It's not about your responsibility or your responsibility or your responsibility. It's about how we come together a unified to move forward in this mission of changing the world for Jesus Christ. And I believe there's a couple things that will help us better become the body of Christ. And the first one is this, is that we must find our true identities, okay? What are your gifts? Do you know? Have you ever really thought about what are my gifts? There's a couple different ways to find those, and and none of them are super complicated. Um, For instance, you could go online and look up spiritual gifts test. And there'll come a spiritual gift test and there's a bunch of questions you can take and it'll tell you about what your spiritual gifts are, all right? Whether it might be hospitality, it might be mercy, it might be compassion, it might be service, it might be teaching. It'll give you an idea of where you're gifted. Now, those spiritual gifts don't just apply to the church, they apply to how you interact with your friends and your colleagues and your fellow students, everything like that. So if you have the gifts of hospitality, even if you're a college student, that means that you have the ability to bring people together and make them feel welcome, right? It's not about baking cookies. It's about being there for people. Maybe you have the gift of compassion. In other words, no matter when you're at work and someone's having a rough day, you see things that other people don't see. You ask that deeper question of not why that guy's wrong today, but what happened in their life to make them this way. You see things deeper and you have compassion on people. 
And so those gifts apply to all different areas, but also to use in the church. Uh, another thing you can do to find your gifts is just to sit down and, and make a list of things that you like to do and things you don't like to do, right? Because oftentimes what we like doing are things that we're good at. That's why we like doing them, because we're good at them, right? And so we, we try that out. Sometimes it's a trial and error thing. Sometimes it's just things that we, we, we know about ourselves, and, and that's how we can find out. Uh, another way you can find it out is ask your friends, ask your coworkers, hey, what am I good at? There are things that people are good at that they do not know about themselves. For instance, when we started this church, there was an individual who um, we felt would be great in our Crest Kids ministry, great working with kids. And so I approached that individual and said, hey, um, would you consider working with kids? He said, I, I don't do really, I don't do kids very well. And I chuckled. He was like, what's so funny? So we had this event uh, out on the, the square. It was an ice cream social when we first started. And um, every time a family would walk up to our tent, this particular individual would get down on his knees and talk to the kids first. And then he would get up, oh, hey, hey, how you doing? I'm so-and-so, I'm meet the parents. And we're like, do you realize that every time a child's around, your primary focus is on those kids and not on the adults? We could see it. They couldn't see it in themselves. And that person's been teaching in our Christ Kids ministry ever since. You see, sometimes we just have to lean on somebody else and say, hey, what, are I, what am I good at? What do you see me doing well? And a lot of times it's things that we don't notice about ourselves. So that's another great way to figure out that our, our true identity is. Now here's the thing. Once you figure all that out, you got to do something about it, right? If you know you're good at something, you should do something about that. Pretty simple combination. Now that I know where my gifts are, how can, I, how can I employ that? How can I use that? And as each person in the church begins to do that, as we begin to discover our gifts and do something about it, it draws us closer to God because now we find ourselves walking in what our creator created us to be. We're no longer opposing him trying to do things our own way. We're now saying, hey, I accept the fact that I have this talent. I accept the fact that I have this gift. I'm gonna walk in this direction. I'm gonna do what God's called me to do. And when you do that, you begin to find yourself being less concerned about what you want to do and more about how you can serve other people, more about how you can be there for them. Because if I'm using my gifts to benefit others, to grow the kingdom of God, and I become less selfish as I do that, and I draw closer to God in the process of doing that. And as I draw closer to God, and you draw closer to God, and you draw closer to God, it's like the wheels on a bike, all those spokes, as they draw closer to the middle, they all grow closer together. And it draws us closer to God, closer to each other, and we become that body. And the Apostle Paul puts it this way in Ephesians 4, 22. He says, to put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires, and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds, and to put on the new self, created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. We're to take what we used to do and get rid of that and do what God has called us to do and move us forward. This is why being an active part of the church is so important. Look, as we spend time with each other and encourage each other, it becomes easier to put off our old selves and put on the new. The more we connect with each other, encourage and lift each other up. Listen, if you're only coming to church on Sunday mornings and listening to what we have to say, and you're not doing anything else the other six days of the week that we're closer to God, it's easy to fall back into the old ways of your life. The things you do the most are the things you're most comfortable with. If those things aren't good for you, you have to stop doing those and start doing something else. That's just a good, good rule of thumb, by the way. If you have a bad habit and you're trying to break that bad habit, you have to replace it with something else. You can't just stop doing the bad habit. Because if you don't replace it with something else, guess what you'll start doing again? The bad habit. You have to take something bad and put something good in its place. That's why God replaces us. He takes that old self and puts in himself into us and makes us a new self. And all of that so we can do the good works that God's prepared in advance for us to do. Now, another way we get to be by a Christ is this. Trust God and have faith in one another. First part is easy. Second part, ah, not so much, okay? So have you been watching your favorite team playing maybe a really important game or something like that? And, and that coach, you love your coach, you're always bragging about your coach to all your friends. Like, we got this guy as our coach. He's the best coach ever. And during that game, it's really close. The coach puts in somebody, you're like, who's that guy? Like, where'd that guy come from, right? Or maybe you were on a team and you were in an intense game and coach put in that guy and you're like, 
What in the world is Coach doing putting this guy in, right? Why do you think Coach put that guy in? Because Coach knows something about that guy the rest of us don't know. And that guy has an important part, even though we don't understand it. Or, or maybe you're at work, and you got this big project coming up, and your boss goes, I'm going to put a special team together to work on this project, and they pick you and a couple of guys, and then they pick that guy. You know what I'm talking about? That guy that nobody likes, that guy that everybody's like, why in the world does he even work here? And now they're put on your team, and you're like, oh, yay, I have that guy, right? But there's a purpose for it, right? That, that guy has a talent or a skill that maybe you don't appreciate or don't recognize, but your boss sees, and that your boss sees is important. So what's generally happening in those situations when that happens? The people who we don't really know that much about, who we don't rely on, who we don't take the time to get to know, those types of people oftentimes can rise to an occasion even though we didn't think it was possible because one, we never gave the time to get to know them, understand them, or trust them. And we all take on different roles and responsibilities, right? Because what's really happening when somebody like that's put on your place, you're thinking that's not what I would do, right? That's not how I would have handled that. That's not the person I would have put in right now. But it's not your game. It's not your call. It's God's. He's in charge. And he's like, I created this person for this moment. When you read the Bible, do you think in that moment, Moses knew who he was? Do you think in that moment, David really recognized who he was? Do you think in that moment, Peter knew exactly who he was? Do you think Paul knew who he was? No, they were just doing their best, living what God told them to do. It's not till much later that people recognize, look back and say, that person lived what God wanted them to do. They were created for that moment, for that place. Mordecai says it best in the book of Esther. Maybe you were created for a moment such as this. It doesn't matter if everybody else understands it. You were here for that moment. You were created for that. And just like the body, the foot has a separate function from the hand. Right? We have five senses, not one. Five senses, because all of them play a unique role in our lives. And if we're going to be honest, some days we... we don't know what part of the body we are, right? Anybody else ever felt like an appendix before, right? You know what the appendix is? It's in your body. What does it do? Nobody knows. It's pointless, right? The only thing I ever heard about an appendix was my mom knew a lady one time that chewed her fingernails all the time, and when the doctor took out her appendix, it was full of fingernail pieces that she had swallowed. Well, you just, you know, maybe that's what the appendix is for. I don't know. It's a fingernail collection thing. I don't know. But... Have you ever felt like that before? Like, I really don't know my purpose. I don't know my place. But can I share with you something? The creator of the universe, when he created the human body, he wasn't like, hey, there's an empty space here. What should I do? I don't know. I'll just stick something there. We'll call it the appendix. It's an afterthought, just like in the book, right? It's, oh yeah, this is stuff after the book that might be beneficial at some point. That's not who you are. God created you for a purpose. He created you for a moment. The Bible says you were fearfully and wonderfully made. He knit you together in your mother's womb to do works that he had planned in advance for you to do. In other words, God thinks you're pretty bussin' bussin'. He loves you. Great plans for you. And he's put you into a body so that you can do things together. And he's created other people in that body who can do things that you can't do to connect to other people that you can't connect to. Through prayer and faith, God will lead each member in the right direction, allowing them to serve God in their fullest potential. We have our part, they have theirs. We need to trust God and have faith that they can get their part done. So as we close today, what part of the body are you? Right? Where, where, where do you fit in to, to Christ's body? Are you a teacher? Do you enjoy leading others? Maybe you're an organizer. Do you enjoy planning or, or hosting things? Are, are you creative or, or musically inclined, right? Do you like being in front of people or do you like being in the back? Do you like meeting new people or, or do you like lo loving on people who you already know? 
Look, no matter where you find yourself, the church, the body of Christ can't function without you. God doesn't make mistakes. You're here for a purpose, on purpose. He has a plan for you. Are you ready to step into what that looks like? And more importantly, as a church, this local body, as a church, big C, across the world, we can't function without you. Because God made you for a moment such as this. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, I pray this morning, God, you would open our eyes to what you've created us to be. God, that you would open our eyes to what you've created us to be as individuals. God, that we would understand the gifts, the talents, God, the, the love that you've poured into us. God, what that means, what that looks like for each of us. But God, that you would also help us understand what you created us to be when it comes to your church. God, you created us and called us into this body. God, what's our role? What's our purpose? God, where, where do you want to see us make an impact? And then God, help us not just to know that, but God, help us to do something about it. God, don't let, let us be like it is in James where we look into a mirror and then forget what we look like. But God, instead, let's embrace what you've created us to be. And let's walk boldly in that. Let's step out of our comfort zones and into your zone. God, help us to be used by you, for you, for your glory. God, that other people might come to know who you are. God, I pray over the next few weeks, you would just open our eyes even more to what you're calling us to. God, how you're connecting us. And God, how much we all need each other because we're one body together. God, help us to lift each other up. Help us to encourage one another. God, give us wisdom and grace to understand what it is you would have us to do. God, in your name we pray these things. Amen.